Thank you, Michael. Um, this talk will be in, in two bits, really. I wanted to say a little bit about the Tenant Farming Commissioner role, because it's a fairly new role, and just explain a bit about why it's been set up and what I'm, what I'm supposed to do. And then I'll say a little bit about the amnesty. Um, and I won't say too much about that, because the others will cover some of the technical details, but I'll talk around some of the what's in the code of practice and the general approach to the amnesty that we're hoping to, to encourage. So, what's this Tenant Farming Commissioner role all about? Well, um, I think it goes back to the Agricultural Holdings Review when it was recognised that actually a lot of landlord-tenant relationships are perfectly good and, and they can sit around the kitchen table and sort things out very easily, but there's a reasonable proportion where it doesn't work as well as that and some of them, frankly, are quite dysfunctional. So, there was a, a feeling in government that the government needed to do something to try and improve relations between landlords and tenants. <laughs> Hence the creation of the Tenant Farming Commissioner role, which you can think of as being something like an ombudsman sitting in between landlords and tenants trying to ensure that there's fair play uh, and, and a reasonable basis for, for a constructive relationship between the two. And the, the role was created by the Land Reform Scotland Act. Um, at the same time, the government created the new Scottish Land Commission, which some of you will be aware of. There are six commissioners on the Land Commission. I sit on the Land Commission as the Tenant Farming Commissioner. There is a small staff for the Land Commission in Inverness, probably going to be more 10 or 12 people. It's not a big body. It's just been up and running since the 1st of April. The Land Commission is going around the country doing evening meetings about what the wider Land Commission is all about, so hopefully you get a chance to attend one of these. So the functions of the Tenant Farming Commissioner are set out in the Act a key one for me is to pre prepare and promote codes of practice which try to set out the sort of behaviours and procedures that would hopefully ensure that the landlord-tenant relationship works well. I'm empowered to inquire into alleged, alleged breaches of the code of practice if someone wants to make a complaint. During the Ag Holdings Review, a lot of people said that the role of agents in between landlords and tenants, which was often very necessary to keep the whole tenant farming sector running, sometimes was less than helpful in the way the agents operated. So government has asked me to prepare a report on the operation of agents of landlords and tenants. That would cover land agents, so solicitors, anyone who sits in the middle between the two parties. I've got to make recommendations for improvements to the Ag Holdings legislation. I can refer questions of law to the, to the land court for a decision. Otherwise, I just work with the other land commission members on anything to do with agriculture and, and, and holdings. But the main function of the post is to encourage good relations between landlords and tenants. The codes of practice are a key part of that. As I said, they set out procedures and behaviours that hopefully govern the conduct of landlords and tenants in all the areas where there's major negotiations between the two parties. They're set within the context of the legal framework, obviously, and a key thing is that they're, they're produced in association with the key industry bodies, so Tenant Farming Association, Farmers Union, um, Scottish Land and Estates, RICS, so they're not produced by me in some sort of ivory tower. The aim is to get all the industry bodies to agree and sign up to the Code of Practice so that it has the support of, of all of these bodies. What I'm trying to do with the codes of practice, I'm looking at, is there a Scottish Government policy covering this area? What's the relevant legislation that covers this area? But above all, I suppose, what is a fair and reasonable approach? That's fair and what's fair and reasonable to both parties in the way that the thing should operate. These are the sort of things where we might do codes of practice, covering rent reviews, improvements, conduct of landlords, succession, assignation, all that sort of thing. These are the things where we're looking at doing codes of practice. Where there's a code of practice, if a party feels that another party has operated out with that code of practice and has breached that code, they're able to make a formal complaint to the Tenant Farming Commissioner. I'm empowered to investigate that and require people to give me the, the relevant information and evidence. I have to publish a decision and a recommendation. If I decide that someone has not behaved well in relation to the code of practice. There are no sanctions, but the hope is that most people will not frankly want to see themselves up in lights on a website saying they didn't behave very well. And that's certainly, I think, the case for a lot of the big agents firms and the big estates will not want to see themselves 
named and shamed on the website. So hopefully that'll be enough to ensure that people stick with the codes. If not, it's open to government to introduce penalties for breaches. And decisions that I make are admissible as evidence in the land court as well. So what the current priorities for me, we're setting up an advisory forum involving all the key industry bodies, really just to meet um, and discuss issues to do with tenant farming and the agricultural holding sector, uh, find ways to move forward, sort, you know, talk about what the current issues and priorities should be. I have to prepare a list for government of uh, updating the list of tenants' improvements which are eligible for compensation. In terms of codes of practice, the first one I've issued is on the amnesty on tenants' improvements, which I'll say a bit about. Very shortly, there'll be another one on planning the future of limited partnerships and one or two others which are in uh, formation. So uh, hopefully every sort of two or three months you'll see a new code of practice coming out. The report on the conduct of agents of landlords is something that we want to put out to independent um, group to commission a survey done by independent people, somebody like Ipsos Mori or somebody, so you may well be approached in due course for your views, good and bad, on the way that agents operate in between landlords and tenants. We've got a reasonable budget in the Land Commission for gathering research and data to do with tenant farming, looking into different aspects of it, commissioning work on innovative ideas and thoughts about how the tech sector can move forward. So we'll be keen to get views from the advisory forum on what sort of work we might, we might commission. So what can I do for the tenant farming sector? Well, I hope the codes will help to ensure that we have a more constructive relationship in places where it's not working well. For areas where landlords and tenants can sit around the kitchen table and sort it out, you don't need to worry about the codes. Just get on with it and keep, keep, keep going. These codes are really only to help people where the relationship is poor or, or agreement can't be reached. If there are complaints coming forward, if someone thinks that a code has been breached, you can make a formal complaint, but I'm trying to encourage people to come and talk to me first decide whether there is a case for a formal complaint. Maybe I can sort it out by having a word with the other party first, um, because once you get into formal complaints, it's not going to do much, frankly, to help landlord-tenant relationships. So I'm hoping we can, it'll be a last resort if there's a formal complaint made. Um, and that, I think, what I should say I, I probably can't do is I can help to sort out problems between landlords and tenants, but if it's a really big issue and there's a really bad relationship, you're probably better getting in a professional mediator involved. That's quite a good way of sorting out these things. I can take it as far as I can, but I, I can't provide a full mediation service, and, and often a professional mediator will help you and be a lot less expensive than going to the land court. I'll try and guide you on what's right and what's wrong and what's right and what's wrong in terms of the legal issues, but I'm not an absolute expert on these, so you still need to rely on your legal advisors uh, in the normal way to do that. So, that's pretty much what the Tenant Farming Commissioner role is about. It's very early days, we're just getting it set up, getting moving. I hope it'll be of some value to the sector, and um, the government will review the role in three years' time and decide whether it's working or it's not working or it needs more powers or less powers and, and we'll see where we've got to by then. So that's that. I think I'll, I'll just move on to say a little bit about the amnesty on tenants improvements. I hope you've all got a copy of the code of practice which is, is, is designed to help landlords and tenants work their way through this issue. Just a reminder, we've got three years to do this starting from June and any notices that are going to be served must be served before the end of that <coughs> three-year period. It's a great opportunity to finally agree a definitive list of tenants' improvements which might be eligible for compensation. Some of you may be lucky enough to think you've got a, 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 an agreed list with your landlord, but um, certainly from the other meetings we've, we've held on this subject, most people are saying they don't believe they've got uh, an accurate and up-to-date list. So here's a great opportunity to get one just a reminder, there's no change to the current position regarding when compensation takes place. The amnesty is not about money now, it's about agreeing which improvements would be eligible for compensation. 
when the, and if the time comes at the end of the tenancy. The key thing about it, is, though, is it does allow some claims to be made even if the proper procedures weren't followed originally when the improvement was made. And again, the onus is really on the tenant to initiate the process, but we do expect landlords to play their part in helping to establish the evidence about um, improvements when they were made, who made them. There are some restrictions on claiming, not many, but the one or two. Uh, in terms of part one improvements where you had to have the landlord's consent, you can't claim for an improvement that was carried out without the landlord's consent. Or if you did something totally different, if you said you were going to build a silage pit and built a cattle shed instead, then <laughs> you're probably not going to be able to claim. In terms of the part two and three impro uh, improvements where you had to give notice or you didn't need to even give to give notice at all, again, you can't claim if it was done despite a landlord's objection. But apart from these uh, restrictions, it, it's pretty much open to you to claim for anything you think is a legitimate um, tenant's improvement. Sometime during the next three years, the list of modern improvements will be updated, so there'll be some new things on that list that will qualify for compensation. You can't claim these in the amnesty, it's not retrospective. The process that we're setting out in the Code of Practice it's really up to the tenant to initiate that process, but we want the tenant and the landlord to get together and share all the relevant information each of them has on what was done, when it was done, you know. So you've got to search all your records and come up with invoices, agreements with the landlord, anything that will demonstrate um, that it was indeed a tenant's improvement. So you produce a list, even if you're not envisaging giving up the tenancy and it, you think you know all this is so far in the future it doesn't matter it's still worth having that definitive list because remember the landlord can only charge rent on what he provided so it's very important that it's clear which are tenants fixtures even if they're not eligible for compensation you still need to know which are tenants fixtures and which are landlords try and get together on the farm and discuss it make sure there are written agreements and written records of all the discussions that you have. Often the misunderstandings happen when people go away from meetings with a different understanding of what was agreed. And if at the end of that process of discussing it between the two of you, if, you're still, if a tenant is still certain that an improvement is one of his and the landlord won't accept it, the tenant can issue what's called an amnesty notice. Uh, the landlord has a certain period in which to object to that, and if he does, then the tenant can refer the matter to the land court. We're encouraging people not to go straight to the amnesty notice, but to try and have that constructive discussion between the landlord and tenant first, and only if that fails, move on to do the amnesty notice. And just a reminder that once that record is updated, then for goodness sake, make sure you keep it up to date in future. That's the way this the law sets out the process for doing this, but it also says that if the landlord agrees, you can have a discussion that includes everything, even those one or two things where, where restrict, there are restrictions on claiming. If the landlord agrees, you can set that aside and you can discuss any sort of improvement. And if both parties agree, then it can be included. But in those circumstances, you can't issue an amnesty notice if, the, if you fall out. That's the difference, I think. So there will be lots of grey areas on this, there's no doubt. There will be lots of issues come up uh, to do with write-down agreements, post-lease agreements, what's the definition of a building, what happens about improvements to the farmhouse, are they eligible, and what happens where there were shared cost improvements in the past. And no doubt other things as well, which will um, need sorting out. I think we just need to try and some of these things we can give some guidance on now. Some of them I think we just have to work through as they come up. And if there's some things that keep coming up everywhere, I'm able to at least refer some of these things to the land court for a decision rather than every landlord and tenant having to fight it out in the, in the, the land court, which may be helpful.